Here's a question for you. Why is there stuff? <laughs> Everything you know is matter. I'm talking molecules, elements, atoms, protons, electrons, quarks, you, me, Pippin, the banana he's gonna eat as a treat for putting up with this. <laughs> it's matter. All of it is matter. And why does matter exist? And this might sound like a question for philosophy, but this is actually a science question. And I'm just saying there is a reason that physics was once known as natural philosophy. Disclaimer, I am the daughter of a philosopher. <laughs> so all of this stuff is matter, but you have probably heard of antimatter. And this is actually a real thing. It's not just a science fiction trope. All of these particles that make up matter have a counterpart particle that is antimatter. For example, a proton is a particle of matter and it is made of three quarks, up, up, and down quarks. And there is such thing as an antiproton and it is made of three antiquarks, anti-up, anti-up, and anti-down. This is the general nomenclature. You pretty much just slap an anti in front of it and if you're writing it, you can put a little bar on top and there you go. You've got your antimatter particle. Pretty much the only exception is an electron, which instead of an anti-electron, I mean, you could say anti-electron, but that is what we call a positron. As the name implies, a positron has a positive electric charge, while an electron, of course, has a negative electric charge. Similarly, while a proton is positive, an antiproton is negative. Charge is probably the easiest example to understand of a property that gets flipped between a particle and its antiparticle, but there are others. Uh, for example, an antiproton has the opposite magnetic moment of a proton, a positron has the opposite spin of an electron, but the mass stays the same. So a particle and its antiparticle have the exact same mass, it's just these quantum properties that can be flipped. Just like antiquarks can come together to form an antiproton, antiprotons and positrons can come together to form antiatoms. <laughs> Anti-hydrogen, which is one antiproton and one positron, and the nucleus of anti-helium, which is two anti-neutrons and two antiprotons, are the only two anti-atoms that have actually ever been observed. But the rest are theoretically possible as well. And in theory, there's no reason that this can't keep going up. So antimatter could come together to form anti-stars, and those anti-stars would shine the same way that stars do. Although to be very clear, the photons themselves are not matter, and so they don't have an antimatter counterpart. But the photons would be produced by an antimatter star in of a regular star. But I mentioned that we've only ever seen two kinds of anti-elements. And so yes, antimatter is a very real thing, but it only exists in very, very trace amounts in the universe. Now you may be thinking, doesn't matter itself only exist in trace amounts in the universe? And yes, that is kind of true because the vast majority of the universe is dark energy and dark matter. To be very clear, dark matter is not the same thing as antimatter, although I did recall once reading about how dark matter might be its own antimatter particle. But anyway, we're not gonna talk about that. So setting aside dark energy and dark matter, that 5% of stuff that's left over, that's what we call baryonic matter. That is the matter we're talking about. And compared to that amount of matter, antimatter is like almost zilch. So you may be thinking, aha, I see the question here. It's why is our universe dominated by matter rather than antimatter? But that's really just a matter of nomenclature and convention. There's nothing fundamentally necessary about an electron having a negative charge. This is just conventions that we use. And so if we were in a universe that was dominated by antimatter, we would just call that matter. <laughs> So the question isn't about which kind of particles are dominating the universe. The question is, why does either kind dominate at all? Here's the thing about antimatter, and one of the reasons that sci-fi writers love it so much. When matter and antimatter come together, they completely destroy one another. This process is literally called annihilation. <laughs> now this isn't magic, it's still physics, so the conservation of energy and momentum still applies. What happens is that the mass of the two particles is converted into energy equals mc squared and all that. Now this is typically in the form of high energy photons, but sometimes uh, lesser particles will be created as well. Now this process can also happen in reverse. Photons can transform their energy into mass and create particles. This is called pair production because it produces particles in pairs of a particle and its antiparticle. And these do have to be high energy photons because there has to be enough energy to be converted into the mass of these particles. The impetus for this video was actually a question a galactite asked about where antimatter comes from. Shout out to Vincent for waiting several years for this answer. And it is a really cool answer. I mean, the fact that antimatter and matter can just be created out of energy is really fascinating. But the real interesting question here is, where did that antimatter go? See, as these particles are being created, which we think they were in the fraction of a second after the Big Bang when the universe was insanely hot, it creates matter and antimatter symmetrically. 
pair production. And as you can imagine, as the universe cooled, if there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter, they would eventually annihilate, and there would be no matter of either kind remaining to do things like form stars, and planets, and galaxies, and you, and me, and Pippin. He's back in his cage. <laughs> but this is clearly not the case because we're talking, and that means that we have a big problem. The most exciting kind of problem that means there's still something more we have to learn about the universe. This problem is known as the matter asymmetry problem, or the baryon asymmetry problem, or the matter antimatter asymmetry problem, and it is one of the biggest unsolved questions in physics and cosmology. And yet another example, by the way, of how things on the very smallest scales, we're talking particle physics, can affect the entire universe, which is one of the things I just really love about astrophysics. Now this asymmetry doesn't have to be very big because the universe is enormous. <laughs> and we know that matter isn't a very large component of the universe anyway, it's only 5% of the total universe. So really you only need about one in a billion pairs to not annihilate in order to create the amount of matter that we see in the universe today. That means, for example, for every one billion quarks in the early universe, there were only 999,999,999 antiquarks. <laughs> and that's enough. Now let me pause to say here that I am neither a particle physicist nor a cosmologist. So while I'm not exactly a layperson here, I'm not really an expert either, but I'm just gonna do my best. First, let's consider this problem from a more cosmological perspective. Since antimatter can clump together and self-interact to form anti-stars and anti-galaxies that would emit photons the same way that matter stars and matter galaxies do, and since we can only see distant objects based on the photons that they emit, it's possible that some of those distant objects are actually antimatter stars and antimatter galaxies rather than matter stars and matter galaxies. It could be that we just happen to live in a kind of local bubble where matter predominates, but there are other bubbles where antimatter predominates. And so in this sort of patchwork universe, if you averaged everything together, there would be equal amounts of matter and antimatter. The problem here is that if there are regions of matter and regions of antimatter, that implies that there are boundary regions where matter and antimatter would meet, and so they would be annihilating there, if not in the present day universe, then definitely in the early universe when it was more dense. And those annihilations would create gamma rays, and we would be able to see those gamma rays as part of the kind of background gamma ray flux. And we just don't see that. So if these kinds of patches are the explanation for this asymmetry, the size of the patches has to be at least comparable to the size of the entire observable universe. Okay, so here's a crazy idea. What if our universe is part of a universe-anti-universe -universe pair? This would place the Big Bang as kind of a mirror, and on our side of the mirror, time flows in one direction and we have matter rather than antimatter, but on the other side of the mirror exists another universe in which time flows the other direction and they have antimatter rather than matter. Now this might sound like one of those unscientific, untestable theories, but there are actually some predictions that are made by this theory that we might be able to confirm. For example, massless neutrinos and the absence of long wavelength primordial gravitational waves. As far as I know, these predictions have neither been confirmed nor ruled out yet, so this is actually currently a somewhat plausible theory. Now the authors of this universe-anti-universe -universe pair theory idea call it a CPT symmetric universe. And that brings us back to particle physics. <laughs> so what is CPT symmetry? Well, it stands for charge, parity, and time reversal symmetry, but it's probably not all that helpful. Now, each of these is an individual symmetry of its own. Charge conjugation symmetry, so that's the C, basically says that if you were able to kind of magically swap all of particles for their antiparticles, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And this is actually true in a lot of ways, but there are some violations, particularly related to the weak force. For example, the decay of a particle called muons. Now a muon decays into an electron, an electron antineutrino, and a muon neutrino. While an antimuon decays into a positron, an electron neutrino, and a muon antineutrino. This seems to be C-symmetric. After all, you can see here that each of these particles is indeed just swapped with its antiparticle. However, the electron is what we call a left-handed electron, and I'm not gonna get into the details of that, it's just related to the properties of the electron. Well, the positron is what we call a right-handed positron. So you could look at the handedness of this particle that is released by the decay of a muon, and you could tell if you were in the muon or anti-muon decay. Okay, so parity symmetry, that's the P, means that a mirror version of a system is identical to the original system. Going back to our muon decay example, if we not only switch the particles and antiparticles, but we also mirror the particles, well now our left-handed electron becomes a right-handed positron. So that means, while it might not be C-symmetric, it is CP symmetric. <laughs> now for a long time, physicists thought that parity symmetry could not be violated, that it was a fundamental property uh, of the universe. But this was actually famously disproven by the Wu experiment 
experiment in 1956. So then they were like, okay, so maybe C symmetry and P symmetry by themselves are not fundamental, but C P symmetry. So like we just talked about with the muon decay, that is inviolable. It's a fundamental property of the universe that you cannot violate C P symmetry. But that didn't last too long because in 1964, a pesky little C P violation was discovered in the decay of a particle called a kaon. Although that was a indirect C P violation and it wasn't until the 1990s that a direct C P violation was confirmed. So this brings us to the T, time reversal. And this transformation is exactly what it sounds like. It reverses the flow of time. So instead of time going to the future, time goes to the past. And once you combine that T in, so you have C P T symmetry, that, as far as we know, cannot be violated. It is an inviolable fundamental property of life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> so a CPT symmetric universe would have matter and antimatter particles swapped, be a mirror image, and have the reverse flow of time from our universe. Okay, I know that was a lot, but it's a really important concept to the problem at hand. Let's go back to the Big Bang and consider how it might be possible to end up with a matter-antimatter asymmetry. And this is something called baryonogenesis, because baryons are the things that make up baryonic matter, and particle physics has a million particle names. I don't really want you to get hung up on those, but a baryon is a particle that's made of three quarks, so that's basically protons and neutrons. Yes, electrons are not baryons, but they are kind of what we call baryonic matter on the like universe scale. I don't know, I didn't come up with these names. <laughs> okay, so baryogenesis led to the existence of baryons in the universe because they did not annihilate with antibaryons. Now there are three conditions called the Sakharov conditions that have to be met in order for baryogenesis to be possible. One, there has to be a baryon number violation. Okay, what's a baryon number? <laughs> it's just kind of the sum total of baryons. So if you kind of assigned all of the particles a number, so you gave baryons a one, and you gave something called mesons a zero. Again, don't worry too much about these details. Mesons are particles that are made of two quarks, uh, like the kaon I mentioned earlier, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, you give them a zero, and then you give antibaryons a negative one. And so you look at all the particles you have, you give them all those numbers, and you sum it up, and that is your baryon number. It's basically how many baryons do you have that are not canceled out by an antibaryon. So you have five particles and three of them are neutrons and two are antineutrons and your baryon number is one. So a baryon number of zero means that you have equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And remember, that's what we expect the initial state to be after, you know, pair production from all of these high energy photons. So if you start with B equals zero, but you end up with more matter than antimatter, that means you have to go from B equals zero to B greater than zero. And so that is a violation of the baryon number because your baryon number didn't stay the same. The second condition is there has to be C symmetry and C P symmetry violation. Without this violation, any process that could lead to a matter asymmetry could also lead to an antimatter asymmetry at the same rate. And so overall, you wouldn't have any asymmetry because you would have B increasing and B decreasing. And so B would just stay at zero. And so the process that causes B to increase has to happen more than any process that causes B to decrease. And the third condition is there have to be interactions out of thermal equilibrium. Basically, we need the system to evolve from a state where it is at B equals zero to a state where it is at B greater than zero and that stays at B greater than zero. Because CPT symmetry ensures that for a system in equilibrium, any process that got you to this B greater than zero state could also happen in reverse and get you back to the B equals zero state and you would stay in equilibrium. So in order to get from B equals zero to B greater than zero and stay at B greater than zero, you cannot be in equilibrium. There has to be something out of equilibrium. So to explain baryogenesis, we just need to understand the particle physics that explains how these three conditions can be met, and that is easier said than done. The thermal equilibrium is probably the most straightforward one because we know that the universe is expanding. And as long as the rate at which the universe is expanding and cooling is faster than the rate at which whatever process would take the system back to its equilibrium, B equals zero, then this condition is met. Now, baryon number is not theoretically considered a conserved quantity. That means there's no reason that it has to stay the same. However, a change in baryon number has never been observed experimentally. So that makes baryon number an accidental symmetry in the standard model, which is our current best comprehensive theory of particle physics. There's no reason that baryon number has to stay the same, but we just have never seen it change. For example, proton decay. So proton decay is a proposed process. It is a theoretically possible process in which baryon number would change because you would start with a proton, baryon number one, and you would end with a bunch of not baryon stuff. And so you'd get to B equals zero for um, a given proton. This has never been observed. And in fact, we have narrowed down that if proton decay does happen, it happens with at least a half-life of 10 to the 29 years, which is an absolutely absurd number. I don't even have any way to put that in context for you. Um, yeah. 
So this condition for baryon number violation is not impossible, but it does require an expansion of the standard model in theory in ways that have not been experimentally verified. And then you need the CP violation. And the standard model does allow for CP violations, however, not enough to explain the observed asymmetry. Now the CP violations permitted by the standard model um, are something called <laughs> the Kabibo-Kobayashi-Masakawa matrix in the quark sector, the neutron electric dipole moment, and the Pontakorvo-Maki-Nakagawa-Sakata matrix in the lepton sector. <laughs> I don't know what that means either, to be honest. So maybe the details here are not something we totally need to grasp, but suffice to say, yes, the standard model allows for CP violations, but we don't understand well enough all of the sources of CP violation that would explain the asymmetry that we see that allows us to have matter in the universe today. And when I tell you guys that this is a very active area of research, I am not kidding because this result literally came out after I started writing the script for this video. And that is that CERN has observed for the first time ever a CP violation in baryon decay in 2025. In this case, it was a difference between the decay of a particle called a buta lambda baryon and its antiparticle. Now, all of the previously observed CP violations were meson decays, but baryons are not only a lot more prevalent than mesons, but they are expected to have similar rates of CP violations. So the fact that we've never seen a baryon CP violation, but we had seen all these meson ones, well, all these, I don't know. That might be a stretch, but we've seen meson violations. Anyway, it was a very big deal to finally see a baryon CP violation. Now, this observation, while it is very exciting, is not new physics. That is, it is consistent with the standard model and it doesn't go far enough to explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry. However, a better understanding of CP violations is absolutely critical. It's a very key piece to being able to ever solve this baryogenesis puzzle. And so back to our question, why is there stuff? We don't know. <laughs> Cosmologists, particle physicists, and science enthusiasts everywhere would love to know the answer to this, and I hope that someday I get to make a follow-up video and explain it to you. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good one. Bye!